Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Republicans propose a nationwide abortion ban. MAGA Republicans win the year's final primaries in New Hampshire, where conspiracy theorist Don Bolduc will face Senator Maggie Hassan, who will be talking to Dan a little bit later in the show. Then, Dan gets the chance to compete against the reigning champion of two takes and a fake, me. <laughs> Congratulations. Aren't you, aren't you excited? <laughs> For your one, your, your one point victory in a three-person three game. All right, let's get to the news. With less than 60 days till the midterms, Republicans in Congress have introduced legislation that would institute a nationwide ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Senator Lindsey Graham's bill would do nothing to protect abortion access before 15 weeks and, in fact, would allow states to ban abortion completely. Uh, the proposal divided Republican politicians. Some are supporting it. Some are saying they want a full ban. Uh, and Mitch McConnell said that most Republican senators would, quote, prefer this be dealt with at the state level. Yeah, I'm sure he I'm sure he hopes that. Um, but even though that's what Mitch McConnell said, here's what Lindsey Graham said about his bill. So I look forward to the debate. I look forward to the vote. If we take back the House and the Senate, I can assure you we'll have a vote on our bill. If the Democrats are in charge, I don't know if we'll ever have a vote on our bill. What do you think, Dan? Should Democrats just put a bunch of money behind that clip and run it as an ad for the midterms? Most of what Lindsey Graham says is like obsequious word salad, but this is a crystal clear delineation of the stakes in this election. Yeah. If you give the Republicans the majority, they will pass a federal abortion ban. If the Democrats stay in control, there will be no federal abortion ban. In fact, Democrats, if we were to get the 52 votes we need, will come together to abolish a filibuster to codify Roe v. Wade and protect abortion access in this country. Thank you, Lindsey Graham. You can now, you have now advanced to me a professional pundit because you have figured this election out. I, like, yeah, like we can, we're about to uh, sort of debate the wisdom of this legislation. For him to just go out there and say that line <laughs> and draw the distinction that clearly, that is, that is something special from Lindsey Graham. I will tell you that. Um, all right, so Graham pitched this as a political solution, which is exactly, I mean, it's, it's, it's all politics. There's no way this thing becomes law in the current political environment um, with Joe Biden as president. As long as Joe Biden is president, there's no way this thing becomes law. So it's a purely a political thing. Uh, and he pitched it as a political solution for Republican candidates who've been losing support over the party's extreme position on abortion in the wake of Dobbs. Um, what was Lindsey Graham thinking here? And we should we should say that uh, one of the responses from uh, one of the Republican senators, Shelley Moore Capito uh, from uh, West Virginia, uh, she said, I don't know what he was thinking there, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you can delve into the mind of Lindsey Graham and help us figure out what he was thinking. Let me try to walk a mile in Lindsey Graham's shoes for mm -hmm. the benefit of this podcast because it's all about the content as elijah would say exactly i would say that this is very much for like when we work for president obama where he would constantly in his uh, sort of socratic law professor method of meetings which you'd find yourself arguing a position he'd be like well what were they thinking and all of a sudden you're answering the question you're like why am i arguing lindsey graham's case but yeah you have put yeah, me in that position so i will do that this is i'm putting you here yeah there you go reason one for doing this in lindsey graham's mind is it gets him attention and Sunday show bookings are what gets Lindsey Graham up in the morning. So there's that. Okay. From a political, that's a personal vision. For the political reason, the argument really for Republicans would be, and it's not a good argument. I am not defending it. Does it make sense? It's but okay. It's okay. Where, where, you, I, you've caveated look, it well. People, I mean, there's, there's any. Anti-abortion Dan Pfeiffer goes off on, a, on an anti-abortion rant. On I PSA. never know what's going to end up on social from this company. <laughs> Dan Pfeiffer defends Lindsey Graham. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I, I, with it, every 15 seconds, I have to offer a caveat to sure, ensure sure, that that'll happen. Sure. Okay, anyway, Republicans know that if you can shift the conversation to a ban after a certain period of time, that is more popular than a complete ban and certainly a complete ban with no exceptions, which is what is happening in states all across this country. And there is polling that suggests 
that a 15-week ban is much po- more popular than the standard Republican position. So ideally, what he's trying to do is get all Republicans to be on board with this theoretically surface-level more popular position. There is a problem with it, just substantively. It does not deal with all of the major problems of the full abortion ban Republicans have. It is some. It is obviously a proposal put forward by people who think they know better than people who actually have to give birth in this country because 15 weeks, and this bill has almost no exceptions about for health of the mother and viability, is that in most cases you are not going to know about the viability of the child until after, you're not going to know about the viability of the pregnancy until after 15 weeks, right? Yeah. That is it's usually close to around 20 weeks when they can look at the anatomy. And so what Lindsey Graham and Republicans are doing is saying that we will force women in this country to carry to term unviable pregnancies at the risk of their health, because we think we know better. That is what he is suggesting here. And in fact, in that press conference, after Graham set up the stakes of the election quite well, um, a woman asked him a question and shared her story of when she found out after 15 weeks that um, she would not have a viable pregnancy, that there were fetal abnormalities, and had to go through the grueling experience of giving birth to that child that died shortly afterwards, which is what the doctors told her would probably happen. Um, And yes, you know, 90 something percent of all abortions happen before 13 weeks but as you point out the abortions that happen after 15 weeks after 20 weeks are a lot of them have to do with fetal viability that risks the life of the baby if the baby is born or the health of the mother and you know lindsey graham is saying in this bill that there's an exception for the life of the mother but there's not an exception for the health of the mother and doctors have been forced in a lot of these states with bans already to have to sit there and be like, well, it, can I perform this abortion? Cause it, you know, is the woman really in danger of dying or could I give her another blood transfusion? I mean, it is like the, the decisions that they are, that the politicians are forcing on doctors and women it is fucking crazy and when you sit there and you and you pick out 15 weeks because of the way that a polling question is worded where like if you word it another way you get a different result i mean it's just it's so gross to try to legislate based on what is theoretically popular or unpopular based on the wording of a polling question and not the science involved in and in, in the in the medical science involved in what, what doctors know about pregnancy and what women know about their own bodies i mean it's it's wild it's wild <laughs> like so that's so the the problem the the political let's talk about the political problem with what lindsey graham has done here since we've now talked about the problem with the actual legislation republicans are split and they're all over the map on this so no one was asking for this <laughs> no republican was really asking for this um, and I also think like it, it seems like voters just aren't going to trust Republicans to make decisions about abortion because it's pretty clear that most of them want to ban it completely. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think the Republican challenge here that Lindsey Graham has forced upon them is sort of best embodied by the fact that Blake Masters, the right wing extremist running for Senate in Arizona, supports Lindsey Graham's bill. But his campaign spokesperson in a since deleted tweet tweeted, why, why, why uh, <laughs> about the news that Graham was interested in this bill? This is exactly right. It, Democrats and activists around this country have done an incredible job of making sure that abortion has stayed at the center of this election ever since the Dobbs opinion leaked many months ago. In a nation of short attention spans, it is Quite frankly, it speaks to the power of the issue, how motivated people are about it, that it has remained the center of this campaign. And at the exact moment where Republicans are trying to shift the focus to something else, Lindsey Graham walks onto a stage and says, just in case you were wondering, abortion is on the ballot this fall. And it has put Republicans in a very difficult position because you can, you have to answer the question, you keep it in the news, you force them to make decisions between activists and the overwhelming, you know, hard right MAGA extremist activists and the overwhelming majority of voters. And it is 
a you know, it, the Graham bill is a sign of just how extreme the Republicans are, but it's also a political gift to Democrats that we absolutely have to take. I also think that because of some of these bans in states now, voters have heard like too many horror stories about the grueling and painful decisions that women have had to make. And those stories have made it more obvious to people that politicians should not play a role in the decisions that women make about their health care during a pregnancy. Um, there's new polling out this morning. Uh, this is a survey monkey poll, 20,000 adults. So it's quite a big poll. Seven in 10 Americans don't think politicians are informed enough about abortion to create fair policies. And no then you just you, you, read, you read that you read that poll result and you just see Lindsey Graham in your mind <laughs> and how he just like stumbled into this fucking thing. It's like, yeah, this is exactly why they believe that because of they believe that because of how Republicans have responded to Dobbs over the last several months, which is fucking all over the map and in an extreme way. Also, who are the people, the 30 percent who thinks politicians should make that should, are informed enough to make that decision? Have you right. seen Congress? <laughs> like it's a medical decision, a personal medical decision. Right. Like, why would you want some Yahoo senator who happens to get a majority of the vote in a polarized? State? It's like it's insane. I mean, the thing to know about Lindsey Graham to always remember is that he is more shameless and opportunistic than you think he is. And he's not as smart as Lindsey Graham thinks he is, right? Yeah, like that, that is, is that like he, that is that is how you end up in this situation. And of course, we don't know for sure how the politics of Graham's bill will play out, but we have a hint because Graham's position was basically the anti-abortion position in Kansas when there was the ballot initiative in Kansas, and it lost because the it, the anti-choice side in Kansas ran ads saying. We only want the legislature to enact common sense restrictions on abortion. We're not trying to end abortion. They didn't. They they basically were with the Lindsey Graham position, right? Like Lindsey Graham and some of these Republicans now think if they can be for common sense restrictions on abortion, then that's going to be the middle ground. But that was the position of the anti-choice side in Kansas, and they lost overwhelmingly. So we've already seen some evidence of how this is going to go. Also, the fact that Mitch McConnell has walked away from it is a pretty good sign that, about what he thinks the politics are. Because Mitch McConnell yeah. supports a federal abortion ban that has been one of his lifelong goals. And the fact that he is now saying, oh, no, it should be an issue for the state is a sign that he thinks what Lindsey Graham did is absolutely miserable politics. And the question among all these things is, are Republicans going to get away with it? And the answer is... I don't know. They will only get away with it if we let them get away with it. And so it's ultimately up to Democrats and all of us to make, keep this issue, the stakes in this election, front and center for the next 50 some days. If you're running a Democratic campaign, how does Graham's ban factor into your strategy? Say you got a Republican opponent like a Blake Masters or a Dr. Oz who's been trying to uh, present themselves as more moderate on the issue of abortion. Well, I think what you're the first step is goes beyond Lindsey Graham's ban, which is you hold them to account for their more extreme previous position, and you never let that go. Yeah. And you hammer it and hammer it and hammer it, and then you just use the Lindsey Graham as another piece of evidence, along with Mitch McConnell's statement months ago, along with what a lot of these candidates said, along with Kevin McCarthy's statement, that if Republicans take control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, they will pass a federal abortion ban. So it won't matter whether you live in a blue state or a red state or a purple state, it won't matter if you win the governor's race or the state legislatures, politicians like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham will make these decisions for you. And that is the, the center of this election. And then, you know, and then you can take that out to all the other issues on which Republicans are overly extreme and out of touch with the American people, from marriage equality to contraception to what books you can read and on and on and on. Yeah, marriage equality, where uh, it looks at right before this recording as if they're uh, not going to find the 10 Republican votes and they want to maybe punt it until the lame duck session after the midterms because they don't think they can get 10 Republicans. Who wants to punt it? Uh, Democrats? Or, or? Uh, no, no. Uh, like the Republicans are saying, oh, we should just push it. We should just push it because we're not going to because basically they're saying they're not going to vote. They're not going to yeah, give and the, votes. And it's not that they can find they can't find the ten Republicans. They could find the ten Republicans if they wanted to, but they know that there that the 
right-wing extremists who fuel their campaigns or the foot soldiers in Republican campaigns will go fucking bananas if they had the the audacity to yeah. suggest that people get to love who they want to love and marry who they want to love. And so they don't want to answer this question now because they worry it's going to cause their base to demobilize. Well, enjoy the vote because you're going to have to vote on it. Um, all right. So the final primaries of the year uh, were on Tuesday in Delaware, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. Uh, where once again, the nuttiest MAGA politicians came out on top. The Republican nominee for Senate uh, in New Hampshire is a guy named Don Bolduc, who thinks Trump won the election, called New Hampshire's Republican governor a Chinese communist sympathizer, has proposed abolishing the FBI because of Mar-a-Lago, and wants to repeal the 17th Amendment, which allows people to elect their U.S. senators, which again is the position he's running for, the senator. Um, another big winner was uh, Kaylee McEnany's former press assistant, Caroline Levitt, uh, an anti-vax election denier who beat a Kevin McCarthy-endorsed candidate in the Republican primary for New Hampshire's first congressional district. Uh, Dan, what do you think? How much damage did uh, Republicans do to their general elections chances uh, here in New Hampshire? Well, they certainly made their chances worse. I think that is safe to say. <laughs> but we also we just have to always remember that in narrow battleground states like New Hampshire, we are operating within a very narrow band, right? There is, yes, they, their chances of winning may have gone down a little bit, but they're still pretty damn good. And that was true in Arizona, whether they nominated Blake Masters or uh, Mark Burnovich, it was, it's true in all of these, you know, Arizona or uh, Pennsylvania, whether it was Oz or McCormick, is they still have a very good chance of winning. And it's very possible that Don Boldick could win and that Kaylee McEnany's 25 year old, proudly unvaccinated assistant <laughs> who defeated a Kevin McCarthy endorsed state department employee, uh, could also win. Like that is within our possibility. It's worth remembering that while New Hampshire was not one of the battleground states that we focus a ton of time on in 2020, Maggie Hassan won by less than 2000 votes in 2016. So this is going to be a very close race, no matter which lunatic the Republicans nominate. Yeah, the good news is Hassan's got a ton of money. Uh, Bolduc has little as of now, but uh, the cavalry could come in there. You know, and she's gonna, she's, she'll also be able to run some really fun ads against uh, Don Bolduc, like, uh, you know, that show maybe the New Hampshire's very popular Republican governor calling him an extreme conspiracy theorist and saying he's not a serious candidate. Call them a Chinese communist sympathizer. Well, no, that's, no, I'm saying that, but yeah, that's, no, Bolduc yes, called yes, yes, yeah. Sununu oh, a Chinese yes, communist. Yes. Sununu called Bolduc a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Uh, although, what? although Sununu said that he's probably, after saying, I would never endorse him now, is saying, I think maybe I'll endorse him if he won. Yeah, and <laughs> the, and Mitch McConnell and Mike Pence have already pledged to put money into this campaign. All the Republican super PACs are going to spend money. It doesn't, they, they like to clutch their pearls before the primary, but then afterwards they get fully on board with no matter how dangerous the candidates. We're seeing the same thing in Pennsylvania with Doug Mastriano. So this will be a fully funded, well-organized campaign. Speaking of dangerous, um, uh, Bolduc uh, told The New Yorker last year he thinks there's a role for the military to play if Trump tries another coup. On, so uh, on Trump's side. On Trump's right? side. Yeah, yeah. No, yes. no, no, yeah, definitely yeah. on Trump's uh, side. I thought you were saying, maybe he was supporting saying the National Guard to protect the yeah, Capitol. No, 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 no. He's like, if there's another stolen election, another quote-unquote stolen election, uh, of course the military might have a role to play. So that's great. He's already trying to backtrack, though. Uh, today, Bolduc said he's, he's now saying the election wasn't stolen, uh, even though he said in the past that it absolutely was stolen. <laughs> And was he Joe, weaking while he said that? And that Joe Biden wasn't the rightful president. Um, and he also said that he wouldn't back Lindsey Graham's abortion ban. So he's already tr he's trying to uh, he's 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 trying just like the rest of them. To, to he's trying to etch, etch a sketch his way back to the middle. Etch. Oh God, <laughs> Romnesia. Yeah, just just a ten year old esoteric political illusion <laughs> for for nerds of a certain I'm generation like ourselves. To see who gets that <laughs> reference? Um, Who wasn't on our payroll? <laughs> yes. Kaylee McEnany's former assistant here, uh, Chris Pappas is the Democrat she's running against, the House member. Uh, he was out. He tweeted this morning. She supports banning abortion. She wants to write the bill to privatize Social Security, and she wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act too. So she's got some. She's got some problems uh, with her positions as well. Yeah, it seems not great. I'll be honest. I mean, it, look, these are going to be two really, really tough races. We are fortunate in our opponents. A lot of they're not in the bag by stretch of the imagination. A lot of work's going to be have, have to be done. But our chances of winning 
a House seat we need to win to keep the majority in a Senate seat. We need to keep the Senate and have any chance of expanding that majority of 52 are a little bit better today than they were on Monday. The uh, Senate Democratic campaign pack spent some money attacking Bolduc's opponent, uh, Chuck Morse, uh, as another sleazy politician with ties to lobbyists and Mitch McConnell. So this is another instance where Democrats intervened uh, in this primary. How are you feeling about that strategy and how it played out uh, in New Hampshire? It works perfectly, and I've never criticized it. <laughs> Look, this is one of those issues where people have really, really strong opinions mm. about whether it is the worst thing that's ever happened or a bit of strate- strategic brilliance. And I just think it's more complicated and nuance. Like, we have, like, we should be very clear. We have a better chance of holding the Senate because Don Bolduc is the nominee. That is, that is a fact. History shows it. Polling shows it. Common sense shows it. More extreme candidates tend to lose. And I think they're much more likely to lose against an avowed moderate with bipartisan credentials like Maggie Hassan. It's hard to know whether what how much impact that money actually had. These, these MAGA candidates are winning pretty easily. Are Democrats just pushing on an open door here? Um, is this the best use of money? Probably not you know, in the world list of things we could be spending money on. But what the one thing I cannot stand is a bunch of pearl clutching from reporters and pundits about how unseemly this is, you know, on if this is unseemly, what the fuck is storming the Capitol, right? (laughs) Like, Like, let's not try to equate two things. And let's also just remember that the true danger to democracy is Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy being charged of the House and the Senate when it come time, comes time to certify the 2024 election, it really doesn't matter whether that 50 Republican senators is like 36% MAGA conspiracy lunacists or 50%. The, it, what matters is who has the gavel. So the best way to say protect democracy, to protect the integrity of the next election, and protect every freedom we care about, is to keep Republicans out of power. Yeah, I really, I'm I'm in the same camp as you. I it's funny you said complicated and nuanced. Um, uh, Axelrod asked me about that because I was on Hacks on Tap this week, one of my favorite of course. podcasts. And Axe asked about this because I know Axe feels very strongly about it as well. But I think it's circumstance dependent. You know, I think in New Hampshire, and it's it's also how you do it, right? A Senate Democratic PAC running ads against Chuck Morse as another sleazy politician a couple months before an election where Chuck Morse easily could have been the nominee is pretty standard fare. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, if, if he, he, he could have won on Tuesday night, he was pretty close. And if he did, then we'd want to run those same exact ads against him and call him a sleazy politician that was tied to Mitch McConnell and a bunch of lobbyists. And by the way, like you said, if Chuck Morse got to D.C., do we think Chuck Morse would stand up for democracy? Uh, if, uh, you know, we had a 2020 issue again, you think he'd impeach Donald Trump? Probably not. Probably not. No, d- definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Look, there's, definitely. Only, there's only one Mitt Romney, people. And I think maybe if we're trying Take to that find... Take out of context. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine. I mean, I can do a lot about why Mitt Romney is able to get away with these things. Other people can. But um, I think maybe if you're looking for a line of demarcation about how to think about these efforts... It is one thing to run an ad about attacking the potential nominee. It is a, but if you attack them as being quote unquote moderate, which we saw happen, I think in Colorado, where you yeah. attack, you're like, this is a moderate anti-Trump. You're then making, you're, that is, I think, I'm not, I'm really not getting into the morality of this because I really don't, it's like in the world in which we're dealing with, like this is like really low stakes from that point of view. But that is risky because that's going to end up strength. If you bet, wrong there if you make those plays and do not succeed then the opponent that you did not want is going to be even stronger than you feared were they to win that nomination uh looking back at the entire primary season now now that it's in the rear view mirror um on the republican side uh whose party is it trump's mcconnell's mix of both it's definitely not mitch mcconnell's party <laughs> no, it, doesn't it isn't seem, doesn't he seem is. like it he... doesn't seem like he had, had a good track record in this uh primary season yeah, it is very clear that this is a party of MAG extremism across the board. You can't even really, you can find like a couple of little examples in some house races here or there that have a lot of extenuating circumstances, but in virtually all of the races that mattered, all virtually all the races that mattered, 
the MAGA extremist one. Yep. And even, you know, I was listening to you and Tommy and Lovett talk about the, you know, the, the who's to blame, Rick Scott or Mitch McConnell. And I just, there's one point of fact that I think is very important for everyone to know. And it shows up in none of these stories about Mitch McConnell, who's just already shifting blame to everyone else, is Mitch McConnell endorsed Herschel Walker. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't like that Mitch McConnell had had his arms around some, you know, moderate, you know, more electable established Republican. He embraced Herschel Walker, knowing everything there was to know about him. And that's why Herschel Walker won easily relative to some of these other places where the mega candidate won pretty easily, but not entirely easily because there was an establishment candidate on the other side. Also, we put Rick Scott in charge of the NRSC. <laughs> yeah, that was fucking stupid. So there you go, Mitch. Um, another sign. This is still Trump's party is the grotesque stunt that Ron DeSantis pulled this week. Uh, So apparently, the state of Florida paid for a flight that took men, women, and children who had reportedly fled from a dictatorship in Venezuela, and they paid for this flight that went from San Antonio to Martha's Vineyard, and then DeSantis made sure that the press knew about it so he could show the MAGA base how he owned the libs by sending immigrants to a wealthy liberal island. Um... The people of Martha's Vineyard had no advance notice about this, um, but as soon as uh, the plane landed and the men, women, and children uh, stepped out of the plane, people on the island immediately responded by offering these families food, clothing, health care, shelter. The whole island pulled together and has really been helping them out. So he really showed us, didn't he, Dan? Ron DeSantis. Look at those, look at those hypocritical Massachusetts liberals welcoming immigrants with open arms. I mean, just what a cruel fucking asshole, right? People, these are human beings. You can be mad they're in this country. You can be mad about how they got here, but they are not political fucking props. They are human beings. And it just, this is about so much more than Ron DeSantis. It's about the Republican Party of the MAGA era, where they're, they, Everyone involved, the politicians, the operatives, the MAGA media, all agree that being a giant asshole is how you get political power. That's what it is. It's the lesson Donald Trump taught us. It's what Adam Server said. The cruelty is the point. Is you are going, it's not just owning the libs, right? It's not just like making fun of people crying because Hillary lost or all of that other stuff. It is about hurting people and showing your base that you are willing to hurt people on their behalf and to hurt people, immigrants, black people, Muslims, whoever it is, it is about showing that you have what it takes to be cruel, to prevent this country from becoming more diverse, more tolerant, more progressive. And it's so fucking furiating. Well, it's also, it's competitive assholery at this point, right? Because you're, Ron DeSantis is trying to show that he's more MAGA than Donald Trump. And so you have to continue to outdo your fellow Republicans that you're competing with um, to show how big of an asshole you can be. And so you continue to do these stunts. But yeah, no, I mean, imagine you flee from a dictatorship, uh, you sacrifice everything, you take your family with you. And then, uh, you know, reports from on the ground in Martha's Vineyard are these people, they were told when they got on the flight that they were going to go to Boston where there would be jobs and shelter waiting. Uh, that's what they were told. They were given, they, they, they didn't eat for a day. They were put on this flight. They weren't told anything. No one in Martha's Vineyard was told this was happening. The plane lands and they just walk off the plane. Imagine you're one of those people, one of those families, and you get off the plane and you realize at some point that the reason you were sent here is because of a political stunt because uh, some asshole governor figured that other people wouldn't want you where they live. So you were sent somewhere else to try to prove a point because other people didn't want you. I mean, it's just it's but here's the thing that you point out, like it it was done to trigger outrage from liberals. This is what he and he now he's got what he wanted. Right. Which is everyone being outraged. And I actually think that the the people who acted best in this situation are the people of Martha's Vineyard and the state of Massachusetts and the Republican governor, Charlie Baker, too, which is they didn't even, you know, lash out. They didn't say, oh, the out- they just said, you know what? Yeah, you, you sent a bunch of uh, people to us who really need help, and we're going to give them help because those are our values. We're going to take them in. We're going to give them food. We're going to give them shelter. And that's that. So 
you send people to us, that's what we're going to do because we show compassion. And I actually think that's the best way to respond because what they want is for everyone to be fucking triggered by this. And I don't want to give you them that what? satisfaction. I don't, I don't want to give them either, but I do think there is a some value in screaming about this in particular because a thing that I worry about a lot is that let's say Trump does not run because he's embroiled. I don't know he's in a prison somewhere or whatever else. There is this sense that anything better than Trump is okay. Yeah. But I was having a conversation with a incredibly anti-Trump former Republican who certainly is more progressive, who is not as conservative as Ron DeSantis, but thinks Ron DeSantis is, is within the band of pre-Trump normalcy. Mm. I was listening to a podcast that Kara Swisher did a long time ago, and she was talking to a uh, like a big tech guy who's a Republican, an anti-Trump Republican who had worked for Peter Thiel, and he's incredibly pro-DeSantis. And the reason he didn't like Trump were all the things that DeSantis does. And so there's this world where DeSantis becomes acceptable to a broad swath of people who found Trump abhorrent because he's simply not Trump. And he's actually more dangerous than Trump. I mean, th- and I think there, there, we do, there's a real chance that Ron DeSantis, if it's not Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis is the, by far the most likely person to the Republican nominee right now. And you can just see a world where they decide, the world decides, the reporters who are yearning to return to pre-Trump both sidesism think that Ron DeSantis is acceptable. And he is a deeply dangerous, incredibly cruel authoritarian who just tweets less than Donald Trump. That's what we're talking about here. And I think that the best way to treat Ron DeSantis is that it was a gross JV fucking stunt. <laughs> like, I think, uh, you know, they, I'm just, we, we, we've went through this with Donald Trump before, too. And, like, the more he's the dictator you should all be scared of, the better it is for him. The more he is the fucking goon who has, like, no regard, not only for most people in this country or immigrants or anyone else, but for his own fucking voters, and he's just a fucking con man, the better off we are. And I don't want us to get off on this further understanding that he's the... Yeah, he is a gross fucking individual. But, like, the MAGA assholes online right now are so mad that the people of Martha's Vineyard welcome these immigrants with open arms and that the stunt didn't work. They're so mad about it. I think the challenge for Democrats in talking about Republicans is trying to find a way to talk about extremism yeah. without making that extremism a proxy for strength. That's that is right. one of the mistakes we made with Trump all the time was we we sort of followed along and he very cleverly would trigger us in that way about how all his authoritarian instincts, like when he would post on Instagram or Twitter, like Trump 2024, 2028, 2032, uh, and all of those things, like having the convention you know, on the White House lawn, you know, in very like North Korea, you know, shades of North Korea there. So you don't want to imbue him with strength because strength is one of the most, you know, it's not healthy, but one of the most persuasive political characteristics. So there, you have to find a way to talk about extremism that is extremism born from weakness, born from fear. And I think that's how we have to think about Trump and Ron DeSantis. What Ron DeSantis did is fucking cowardly. He's a coward. Uh, and it was cheap too, and it didn't work. So fuck him. Um, Okay, when we come back, Dan will talk to New Hampshire Senator Maggie Hassan. And one more thing, Dan, uh, Lindsey Graham's announcement has come just in time for National Voter Registration Day, which is this Tuesday, September 20th. Uh, Everyone should know that Vote Save America is teaming up with our friends at NextGen, uh, who have ways for you to register young voters by joining their call, text, and social teams online or a state team in person. So head to votesave.us slash NVRD to get involved. Again, that's votesave.us slash NVRD. The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Simply Safe. As inflation rates have hit a 40 year high, researchers are noting an uptick in home burglaries and property crimes. Make sure you're protected with Simply Safe home security. Simply Safe has everything you need to feel safe at home sensors for every window and door, indoor and outdoor HD security cameras, hazard detectors to guard against fires, floods, and carbon monoxide. Because it's simply safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. With 24-7 professional monitoring, Simply Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency, even if you can't be reached. Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. Their monitoring experts use proprietary advanced response technology to visually confirm when a break-in is real so you can get the highest priority police 
dispatch. I set up a Simply Safe all by myself, and uh, it comes. In the, it, you set it up; it's fantastic. It it works incredibly well. You can rely on it. You can count on it. It feels very um, it's just very. Uh, it's a very good system. Very I can't good believe system. how uh, reliable it is. Never never gives you a problem. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafecom slash crooked. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafecom slash crooked because there's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article has everything you need to turn your bedroom into your best room, all for a great price. Article offers cozy beds, swanky headboards, and tons of lighting options to help you set the tone. Love Article. We have plenty of Article furniture here at Crooked Media. We got some uh, there. It's comfortable. It looks good, and it was affordable, which is great. The easy shipping. Everything was everything was wonderful. Article combines the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Article's team of designers focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. They're dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century Scandinavian industrial and Bohemian designs. Fast, affordable shipping is available across the USA and Canada, and it's free on orders over nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. Article cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. No showrooms, no salespeople, no retail markups. You save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Right now, Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked. The discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Pod Save America is brought to you by Outer Known. Outer Known is offering men's and women's clothing where style meets sustainability. Their mission is to provide great clothes that don't harm the environment. Sustainability is not something they take lightly. It's literally why the company exists. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. 95% of the products are made from organic or recycled materials. Outer Known clothes are high quality. They're sustainable, comfortable. They fit great. It's timeless style made to last for multiple years. Tommy, I think you were just talking about uh, Outer Known... I don't know, sweatshirts on, uh, on Crooked Slack. Yeah, well, we do live in Los Angeles where you'd think it's um, too warm for a sweatshirt, but our office is so cold that I keep an outer known sweatshirt on my desk at all times because it looks good and it keeps me warm. It certainly does. It's very comfy. That, very comfy. That's exactly what I was looking for, Tom. Go to outerknown.com today and enter the code Crooked at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's outerknown.com, O U T E R K N O W N.com. And remember to use the code Crooked at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, outerknown.com, and don't forget promo code CROOKED for 25% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Stamps.com. If you're a small business owner, you know how important it is to be ready for the insane holiday season. Luckily, Stamps.com has everything you need to make your life a whole lot easier. I have to check the date. We're September 13th. Jeez. Holiday season. It's almost here. It's almost here. Stamps.com is the 24-7 post office that you can access from anywhere. Say goodbye to lines, traffic, and hassle. That's why we've used Stamps.com since our earliest days here. Since our salad days. Our salad days here at Crooked Media. You can get access to the USPS and UPS services you need to run your business right from your computer. Protect your margins with major discounts on USPS and UPS rates up to 86% off. Print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and printer. With Stamps.com's switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates. And if you're running an online store, Stamps.com works seamlessly with all the major shopping carts and marketplaces. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Here in September. Get started with stamps.com today. Very far ahead. Sign up with promo code CROOKED for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code CROOKED. Joining us now is the Democratic Senator from New Hampshire, Maggie Hassan. Senator Hassan, welcome to Pod Save America. Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be with you. After Don Boldick won the primary in your state of New Hampshire on Tuesday, Donald Trump took to Truth Social and wrote the following. Nice! Exclamation point. The Trumpiest people all won in New Hampshire last night. Would you like to take a moment and thank former President Trump for this very trenchant observation about your opponent? Um, all I can tell you about my opponent is that he is the most extreme candidate for the United States Senate that we have seen in decades. Don Baldock would be a yes vote for a national abortion ban. Uh, having said we should rejoice, that was his word when Roe v. Wade was overturned. Uh, he would like to eliminate Social Security, make drastic cuts to Medicare, uh, is an election denier and um, open to abolishing the FBI. So uh, I will be making the case about uh, the choice in this election. Uh, I 
think we need an economy that works for everybody. And I have a record of delivering bipartisan results to the people of New Hampshire on the things they care about. And I will be uh, working to make uh, the choice in this election very, very clear to folks. So you mentioned some of Bolduc's, uh, I would say, unique opinions, like abolishing yeah. the FBI, but those are not his only unique opinions. So I thought maybe we could just go through of that, some of them now that you guys are facing off and just maybe get your take on them and see if uh, get you on the record on the, on these sorts of things. OK, so first, do you agree with Don Bolduc that we should abolish popular elections for U.S. senators and simply have uh, state legislators pick them? Uh, obviously, I would disagree with that heartily. Um, look, New Hampshire is the first in the nation primary, uh, and we're first in the nation because we actually were the ones who had the idea that regular citizens should be engaged in electing uh, their presidents as well as members of Congress. So um, the idea that somebody running for U.S. Senate in New Hampshire would try to take away that right of direct involvement in Senate elections is astonishing. I would take it. I won't make you go through all of these, but I would take it. You will probably also disagree that Governor Kristen Inouye is a Chinese communist sympathizer and that Bill Gates is trying to implant microchips via the COVID vaccine. Opinions offered by your opponent during this election? Yeah, he he has offered really outrageous opinions, um, and they are obviously just dramatically out of touch with where Granite Staters are, whether they are Republicans or Democrats or independents. Um, it is astonishing. Having said that, I will let you know that uh, Mike Pence was in the state raising money for him yesterday, and Mitch McConnell is planning to spend $23 million against me in this campaign. So they're all in with Don Bolduc. Uh, and uh, it's just going to be a really, really close and tough campaign. It's also my understanding Don Bolduc has been a has pushed the big lie, has questioned the legitimacy of the 2020 election, but he's already beginning the process of trying to erase some of these extreme positions. He came out, I think, this morning and said that uh, he now thinks Joe Biden won the election. Um, I, t I imagine that you're you're not going to let him get away with this sort of, you know, quote unquote, etch a sketch of his uh, extreme record. Right. Nobody should be fooled by what Don Bolduc said this morning. Uh, he is an election denier. He has been traveling around our state for over a year now, spreading the big lie. On the debate stage in the Republican primary in August, he uh, promoted the big lie again, saying the election was stolen, and went as far, too, as to say uh, that should the results of the 2024 election uh, be different than the ones he wants, he would work to overturn the election. Uh, so this is an election denier. Uh, this is somebody who would undermine our democracy. Uh, and at a time when what I hear from my constituents, um, which is that they want us to work together the way people in New Hampshire do, uh, to actually lower costs and uh, do things like um, bring American manufacturing back home like we did in the Chips and Science Act. Uh, they want us to help address now, uh, we've worked on prescription drugs, lowering those costs, energy, lowering those costs. We're taking on climate change, but we still got work to do on things like housing and childcare costs. They want us to work together and get these things done. Uh, and instead, Don Bolduc just wants to pull us backward, uh, whether it's abortion, whether it's eliminating Social Security, uh, whether it's denying the election um, and undermining our democracy. So um, I will say to folks, if, if you're interested in learning more about uh, my record and my campaign and how you can help, please go to MaggieHassan.com. We'd love to have people involved. You can tell you have a very talented politician who gets the website in before I even ask the question about the website. So very, very good. I'm sure your campaign team will be very pleased with that. Um, a lot of people, you have mentioned bipartisanship several times in this interview. A lot of people think, particularly in the wake of the 2020 election, that bipartisanship would be dead. The Republican Party is in the thrall of Donald Trump and a bunch of MAGA extremists. Most of them uh, are election deniers. Uh, most of your, Many of your Republican colleagues in the Senate are election deniers. But... According to the Luger Center and the McCourt School of Policy, you ranked as the most bipartisan senator of 2021 and the most bipartisan Democratic senator in nearly 30, the 30 years they've been collecting data. How are you able to work across the aisle to get something done in what might be the most polarizing, uh, divisive political environment we've had in a very long time? I look to the example that my constituents set. Uh, New Hampshire is 30% Democrats, 30% Republicans, 40% independents. Uh, as you know, we are the live free or die state and we take that sentiment to heart. We really revel in our ability to speak our minds freely and openly and have vigorous disagreements. 
But then after we do, uh, we sit down and figure out how to solve problems and move the ball forward uh, because we know moving forward uh, is really, really important. And so I try to take that example. Um, I also uh, am usually pretty confident that my Republican colleagues are hearing about some of the th same things from their constituents that I'm hearing about from mine. A great example of that is surprise medical bills. I worked with Bill Cassidy from Louisiana to ban that practice. That's another way of lowering people's health care costs, right? Um, and um, that bill, which went into effect in January, has now prevented uh, 2 million plus uh, surprise medical bills from being delivered to people. Um, that's because Bill was hearing the same thing as I was. And if you can keep the temperature lower and just keep talking to each other, uh, you can get some of these things done. And I think it's also a, a really important reminder to people that while um, there's a lot of coverage of the polarization, we passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill um, that I was happy to help negotiate. We did bipartisan postal reform, post office reform. We did a bipartisan bill to help our veterans get the health care they need finally for toxic exposures. Uh, we did the Bipartisan Gun Safety Act. Uh, and then uh, we did the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, uh, which I was one of the original sponsors of, which is bringing manufacturing back home, helping us with our supply chain challenges, lowering our costs um, by increasing the supply of semiconductors, among other things, helping us outcompete countries like China and um, bolstering our national security. So those are the things we have been able to do. Um, and I think it's a real testament uh, to those of us in uh, the Senate, both parties who do know that you have to keep working just the way your constituents do. Do you think there are, even though we are getting pretty close to the election year, do you think there are prospects for other uh, pieces of bipartisan legislation this fall, maybe Electoral Counts Act reform or um, enshrining marriage equality? Uh, I am hopeful, uh, you know, that often you don't know whether these things are going to come together until kind of all of a sudden they do. And that has to do with a lot of different factors. Uh, we're obviously getting uh, close to the election. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I know how important it is to the American people and to our democracy that we move forward here. You know, um, we talked about the fact that I'm running against an election denier, uh, but uh, Mitch McConnell and Mike Pence seem to be all in with that uh, because um, among other things, uh, I won this seat uh, in 2016 by only 1,017 votes, unseating a Republican. So they want the seat back, right? They're coming after it really, really hard. Um, a lot of things are at stake, everything from a woman's uh, right to make her own decisions and be a full citizen in the democracy uh, to um, climate and a bunch of other things. Uh, but I do know that uh, democracy is on the ballot too. And I think it's really important for all of us just to keep focused on that. And I think one of the things bipartisan accomplishments really help people um, understand is that their vo voice and their votes matter and that democracy can deliver when they exercise them. And that's also what's on the ballot uh, this fall. You've mentioned abortion several times, your opponent's extreme views on abortion, it being a driving force in this election. Uh, earlier this week, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, proposed a federal ban on abortions after 15 weeks. I want to get your reaction to that bill and what that maybe says about the dangers of a Republican Senate, if we, were they to take over the Senate. Yeah, I want people to be really clear here that a national abortion ban is on the ballot in November. McConnell has been pursuing this for decades. Um, Mike Pence supports a national abortion ban, I think said within the last week or so uh, that we should he, that he wanted the anti-choice forces to double down on achieving a national abortion ban. Um, my opponent has said that uh, New Hampshire's abortion ban, uh, which the Republicans just passed last year, doesn't go far enough and that he would never vote against anti-choice legislation in Washington. Um, it is astonishing to me that anybody seeking to represent uh, citizens in Congress um, at the same time wants to take away the rights of half of the people they would represent. This is about whether in the world's greatest democracy, women are going to be second class citizens or not. And I will continue uh, to make the case uh, wherever I am in New Hampshire uh, that and, and I'm hearing about it from people in New Hampshire all over the state, all political backgrounds. Um, this is a really serious moment for our democracy because taking away rights from women, from half the population, undermines the democracy in significant ways, uh, as does things like election denial. Um, so democracy is on the ballot 
a woman's health and safety and full citizenship is on the ballot. Another, you know, according to polls, central concern for a lot of voters is inflation. While gas prices have been going down for months now, yeah. uh, we got a report out this week that inflation still remains frustratingly high. Can you talk a little bit about what you want to do in addition to the reflation in addition to the Inflation Reduction Act to lower inflation and what, if you get reelected, Democrats to back the Senate, what you're thinking would be the next sort of steps here to lower costs for consumers? Yeah, no, there's a number of things. I'll start by just saying I continue to push for a suspension of the federal gas tax um, that puts some more money in people's pockets um, and just um, really um, lets people know that we are taking um, short-term steps as well as the long-term steps, because the Inflation Reduction Act is one of the things uh, that we've done, but the, the Chips and Science Act is one of the other uh, measures we've taken that really goes after inflation in some longer-term ways. Uh, but in addition to the gas tax suspension, uh, I think the administration uh, can take steps to help uh, New Englanders and other people in cold climates afford to heat their homes. Um, this winter, that's one of the key issues that I'm hearing about from people in New Hampshire, uh, because our energy prices have just gone way up, and uh, there are measures that the uh, administration could take to help with that. Uh, the other things that I think are beginning, we're really beginning to see drive inflation are housing costs uh, and childcare costs, too. Um, in New Hampshire, we have a real housing shortage. Our vacancy rate is only about 0.5% and a healthy market is about 5% vacancy. Um, and so rents are being raised. Uh, people are really worried about being able to stay in their homes. So it's well past time that we increased investments in the low and moderate income housing tax credit, which funds most of the low and moderate income housing that we build in this country. But I've also got a, a bill that will help uh, state housing um, finance agencies uh, get more workforce housing uh, in towns throughout their states, uh, along with um, trying to establish and support um, and fund uh, eviction mediation programs, uh, which are critically important because often people uh, lose their homes because of a small shortage in their rent payment. And if you can help people mediate that, uh, you can really um, slow down the churn that eviction causes. So there's short-term things, long-term things, um, but housing is just a huge part of this. So is childcare, obviously. Uh, and last thing I'll say, um, Somewhere around 6 million Americans tell us that they would be back in the workforce if they could have help with caregiving responsibilities for a loved one who is aging or has a disability. So getting our home and community-based care system uh, in shape and expanding access to it and paying people who provide home care a uh, family sustaining wage is really, really an important piece of expanding our workforce um, to really fight inflation, but also help people um, earn a living and, and pay their bills. Senator Maggie Hassan, thank you much for, so much for joining us. And just to all of our listeners out there, do not take this race for granted. New Hampshire is always very close. It was very close in 2016, and it is going to be close again. Uh, so please, if you can, look look away to look for a way to help Senator Maggie Hassan beat a, yet another MAGA extremist, expiring insurrectionist, etc. Thank you so much, Senator. Thanks so much, Dan. Be safe. Positive America is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has truly innovated and changed the game with sugary cereals. They spent time to perfect the crunchy texture and develop an astounding variety of flavors so that they always hit the spot but without any of the things that are bad for you. Magic Spoon's packed with protein and a great healthy snack for just about anyone, whether after a workout, during a hike, or at midnight when the cravings strike. There's a flavor for everyone from the richest chocolate to the sweetest honey nut. Here's what we got. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. It's low-carb, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and only 140 calories a serving. You can build your own box with a huge variety of appealing flavors. Maybe you like the classics, like Tommy. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter. Maybe you like the cult faves, like Love It. Blueberry muffin, maple walnut, honey nut. Maybe you're indulgent like me and you like cookies and cream, oh, cinnamon butter, roll, peanut butter. Whatever you like, go to magicspoon.com slash cricket to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And be sure to use our promo code cricket to check out to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. You're not going to face that, that issue. 
because you're going to love it. We eat it all the time. You're going to love it. I got a whole bunch in my uh, pantry right now. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cricket and use the code cricket to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Pod Save America is brought to you by Policy Genius. Did you know having life insurance through your job may not be enough? Most people need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families. And if you leave your job, the policy doesn't go with you. Where does it go? Beats me. That's why you need to check out. Goes to Vegas? Policy Genius. Okay. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price on life insurance. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Options start at just $17 per month for $500,000 of coverage. Just click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com to get personalized quotes in minutes and find the right policy for your needs. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand throughout the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees, and it doesn't sell your details to third parties. Head to PolicyGenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's PolicyGenius.com. PolicyGenius.com. Pod Save America is brought to you by Beam Organics. Did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Yep, suffering from them all. And that sleeping less than six to seven hours per night is linked to reduced white blood cell count. Didn't know that. White blood cells protect our body against illness and diseases, fighting viruses, bacteria, and more. Not many people realize this, but having a consistent nighttime routine is so important. A better tomorrow starts tonight. A better tomorrow starts tonight. Something Tommy always says. Yeah, it's a tattoo. Introducing Beam Dream. Beam is the world's most innovative functional wellness brand with unique products for everything from sleep to recovery. And today... Our listeners get Beam's biggest discount available for their sleep product, Dream Powder. <laughs> Dream Powder. Dream, <laughs> Dream Powder <laughs> is their best-selling healthy hot cocoa. It contains natural sleep-promoting premium ingredients, triple lab tested, no THC, and you wake up refreshed. 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream, and 99% of people experience better sleep quality. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir, and enjoy before bedtime. I love Beam Dream. We love Beam Dream. You get to drink some hot cocoa and then it's lights out. (laughs) Yeah. Find out why Forbes and New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes like Danica Patrick and Baker Mayfield. I'm going to have to take him out of top. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's an NFL quarterback. What am I saying? You got something, love it? No. You got a sports comment? If you don't love it, you can get your money back guaranteed. For a limited time, get up to 35% off when you go to shopbeam.com slash cricket and use code cricket at checkout. That's Beam's biggest discount available at shopbeam.com slash cricket and use code cricket for up to 35% off. All right. Uh, we're back. Before we go, we played two takes and a fake for Tuesday's pod, but it, it, the game originated with Dan Pfeiffer. It was Dan's idea right here on a Thursday pod, so we figured – we got to let Dan play before we uh, go on to other other games. So we're gonna we're doing one more round here of two takes and a fake to see if Dan can knock off the reigning champion, me. And here we have Elijah Cohn, our chief take officer, who's going to take. Before we get started, as much as I like to get credit for other people's ideas, I would like to just once again state that I basically stole this idea from the Ringer's Fantasy Football podcast, which does. Uh, two jargons and a lie. Similar concept. We've adopted it to politics, but they they are the they get the original credit. Yeah, well, you get you get the adaptation credit. So I mean, no, no one else brought it to us. Oh, <laughs> yes. I mean, I get more credit than you guys. I just don't right, get exactly. all the credit. Exactly. Yes, yeah, well, yeah. I didn't come up with the game. Yeah. I mean, two truths and a lie is is an age old game. It's royalty free at this point. I mean, credit to the <laughs> yeah. ringer, they're fantastic. I mean, they should have they should have they should have patented it. But, okay. Dan, did you have a chance to listen to how it went on Tuesday's show? I absolutely did. <laughs> are, you, are you intimidated at all going up against the standing champion? I mean, yeah, a little bit. We'll see. I mean, I don't know anyone who consumes more takes than John other than you, so <laughs> it, it's hard, it, he's hard to beat. He, John went three for three. He identified all the fake ones on Tuesday, and I will say that in preparation for this one, I did a dry one, dry run with Tommy this morning. And oh he wow! Went 0, 0 for three. Tommy went zero for three. Okay, so, all right. Oh no! See. Now I'm. Oh now you, you're in my head now. <laughs> yeah, it's all mind games. Um, <laughs> so just to recap how it works, I'm going to read you guys three takes. The producers have seen them. You guys have not. Two of the takes are real. One is fake. You all must decide which take is fake. This game has three rounds across three different topics. You guys ready? So ready. 
you're well versed in topic topic number one. It's Lindsey Graham. So I'm hoping you guys get this one. Obviously, we talked about Lindsey Graham a lot at the beginning of the show. There are a lot of takes about him out there right now. So let's sample a few. Take number one. Lindsey Graham has never been a big pro-life advocate. He wants Republicans to lose. This is sabotage. It's the only way to explain it. And it's take number one. Take number two. At the end of the day, Lindsey Graham cares about Lindsey Graham. It's who he is. It's who he always has been. He wants to be in the spotlight, and this was just a chance for him to do that. Take number three. Advocating for a national abortion ban is more important than any short-term politics. Enthusiasm among pro-life Americans is equal to or greater than any motivation by people that support abortion rights. I should note, I should have noted, all of these are from Republicans. So that sabotage point is from a Republican also. Which one is the fake, guys? Can you read two and three again? <laughs> taking this very way. seriously. <laughs> yeah, you can't see. John is really he's scrunching his face. He's really thinking yeah. here. Take two. At the end of the day, Lindsey Graham cares about Lindsey Graham. It's who he is. It's who he always has been. He wants to be in the spotlight, and this was a chance for him to do that. Okay. Take number three. Advocating for a national abortion ban is more important than any short-term politics. Enthusiasm among pro-life Americans is equal to or greater than any motivation by people that support abortion rights. They're thinking. It's an audio medium on YouTube. You can see them thinking here. They're really... I... I'm going to go with two. What's, what's your reasoning behind that? What, what sticks out about two? <laughs> I think it's two on the nose. Interesting. Dan? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with one. Mm. Two seems like something Steve Schmidt would say about Lindsey Graham. Ooh. Although, and three seems like, seems like a take I kind of sort of maybe heard. Uh, I feel like that about three, too. Yes. All right, well, the champion is off to a strong start. Two is the fake one. Yes! I mean, that's you just basically took a Steve Schmidt take and made it less pretentious. <laughs> you said, I, when I, I started sweating earlier in the show because I was like, Dan said basically that also. Yeah, it's Fountain my take, just less clever. Yes. Sure. Just take, take took my one, take though. and made it less interesting. Great job. All right, I'm down one, oh, one to the... The reigning who said, champ. Who said uh, was number was the was number one from Charlie Kirk? It was from Matt Walsh, actually. Charlie Kirk did okay. weigh in on this. He said it was election interference. What Lindsey Graham was doing. <laughs> that's a fucking that would have got. I saw that points. somewhere. That was I a, think someone on our team take. gave us that one. I think that was in our prep somewhere. Well, that's why I had to take it out. Swapped in. Oh, that was Matt a clip. Walsh. That was Andy. Andy. Okay. That, that was a clip. That was a potential clip. That's what it was. Okay. Anyway. And take number three. Uh, it being more important than short term politics is Mike Pence. So that's where I heard it. Yeah, I did hear that. Okay. Moving on to our second topic, the culture war. I was texting you guys last night. You guys are not uh, regular soldiers in the culture war. <laughs> How well versed are you in the current outrage cycle over black, brown, and gay characters in TV and movies? Yeah, I was saying this yesterday. It's been it's been a busy few weeks with uh, with with this podcast and offline in the wilderness. I, I have I have not. I have not seen any of these takes, so this is going to be a tough one. I did not even know this was going on. Dan, I don't think the culture wars come for below deck or iron chef yet, so you're... Look, I'm well, caught up, on, ha- I'm caught up on House of Dragon. I'm aware that there's a Lord of the Rings show that I have not yet seen. I am aware vaguely of the Star wars s controversy around some of the characters, so let's see what you got here. So all three of these controversies are real. Two of the quotes are real, but one of them is fake. But again, all three of the controversies are real. So controversy number one is around the new Little Mermaid being black. Here's the take. It's not silly. To be honest with you, it's insulting. How much more of this are we supposed to accept? A black Little Mermaid? The woke left is coming for your entire childhood. That is number one. Number two is about non-white actors being cast in the new Lord of the Rings show. Here's the take. 
It perverts and corrupts Tolkien's medieval universe. They're trying to wokeify Middle Earth. It threatens the story's believability. And take number three is about gay parents in the children's show Peppa Pig, which is about <laughs> animated talking animals. Quote, there's no such thing as lesbian polar bears. If we're worried about the ice caps melting, we definitely don't want to push polar bears to be homosexual. Guys, which one is fake? Uh, I will say that I um, watch Peppa Pig almost every morning. You do? <laughs> yes. Do you know about Bluey, by the way? Uh, so thank God, finally now we're watching Bluey, which is much better than any of the other children's programs we have watched. Like I, mean, I act- children's programs, Bluey is a top 10 show on global television. I know, now. like I actually want to finish Bluey, and sometimes when Charlie runs out of the room to play with trucks, I want, I'm like, I want to know what happens. Now, fortunately, they're pretty short episodes. Peppa Pig- Seven, seven minutes. Peppa Pig is getting a little, we've seen way too many Peppa Pig episodes now. <laughs> All right. Anywho, you. Was, anywho, <laughs> it's weird we're not more fully versed in the culture wars. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dan, you go first this time. You go first. I'm gonna go with three, just because I want to live in a world where someone on the crooked staff came up with that take. Yeah, I'm gonna go with one. And the result is. John, again, he just <laughs> sniffs out the fake takes. I don't know how it's possible. Um, three, uh, the lesbian polar bears is from Allie Beth Stuckey over at uh, The Blaze. And the Lord of the Rings quote is from CNN. Uh, there are a lot of fake uh, Little Mermaid takes. But there are a lot of real Little Mermaid takes out there. Uh, Matt Walsh from The Daily Wire said a black Little Mermaid is unscientific and Candace Owen said a Black Little Mermaid is a mockery. So those takes are out there. I actually watched the Matt Walsh take on video, and believe it or not. The leap from Peppa Pig to the lesbian polar bears was just so... It, it's just too hard to imagine someone coming up with that. <laughs> I, I, I have greater faith in the comedy room at Crooked Media. But... It's not even that it was... Co- it's not even comedy. It's just... It's, it's, it's so fucking weird. funny. It's it so is weird. good stuff. It is quality stuff. Mm. All right, I've already well, lost, but let's see if I can salvage some respect here. Just yet another <laughs> Philadelphia area team losing to a Boston area team. Fucking story of my life. Oh, that's great. That's great. We can say this one's worth two. I mean, just to, to add the stakes. No, no we're not no, saying don't. that now. We're you know not. what? Let's, let's. I know your generation's in participation trophies, but not us, kid. All right, look, we. <laughs> yeah. Look, I lost. I can take it. Let's, let's move on. Mm. All right. Well. The subject of this next one makes us all lose in a way. It is Mike Lindell. Uh, For those of you who are not familiar, Mike Lindell is famous first for creating a pillow company called MyPillow, and then he transitioned into being one of the country's biggest election deniers. This week he made some news. Uh, I believe we have a clip if we want to play that. The FBI came after me and took my phone. They surrounded me at a Hardee's and uh, took my phone. I run all my business, everything with... um, um, they could have just, what we've done is weaponize the FBI. Um. Importantly, he said it's disgusting. He did not mean Hardee's. He meant the FBI taking his phone. We just want to put that out there. Hardee's is a wonderful place. <laughs> when was the last time you ate a Hardee's? Come not on at now. all. I'm just, just, just <laughs> trying to be in touch here. I don't, never, I don't think I've ever been to a Hardee's. I made, 100 years ago on this podcast, remember when Andy Pudzer, I think, the head of Carl's Jr. was going to become Secretary of Labor briefly? Mm. Yeah, I made some Carl's Jr. jokes on here about it not being good, and boy, there's a the Venn diagram of Carl's Jr. fans and Positive American listeners, circa 2017, two overlapping circles. People look. I love a, I love a fast food chain. I just we don't. I don't think we had any Hardee's in New England. Yeah, I want to, and I think we're this is we now live in a Jack in the Box state as opposed yeah, to a Hardee's so state. Go. I think. Anyway, Elijah. So yeah, go so, ahead with so, your so takes, Mike Lindell. Yes. His phone has been taken by the FBI. That's exciting. Um, can't wait to see what they find on there. Uh, but so I'm guessing people had some takes about this. It was universal laughter, Mike Lindell. Uh, but we decided for this last question, we were going to do two real Mike Lindell quotes Ooh. and one fake Mike Lindell quote. I like it. I uh, like it. He's got some heaters. Uh, good luck is all I can say. <laughs> Spotting the fake one. He's got some heaters. Um, <laughs> so quote number one. We've been working on a class action lawsuit against all voting machines. 
We've got county commissioners and clerks on board as plaintiffs. It's the most important class action lawsuit in the history of America and in the history of the world. Uh, here's quote number two. The January 6th committee, it's really a deep state operation. I've seen the documents. I'm trying to get copies of the documents and I'll be releasing them hopefully next week. But for Fox News to air any of it, at this point, Fox News is working with the deep state. And here is quote number three. All of our employees are bu busy making pillows right now for the truckers. I plan to drop the pillows from a helicopter with little parachutes. I cannot give the exact details or there will be obstructionists. Which one is fake, guys? Hmm. You go first this time, John. I think it I think it has to be three. <laughs> <sighs> Little parachutes and pillows. But but if it's not hmm. three, that's really funny. <laughs> Can you read one again? <laughs> Oh, Happily. wait, no, one's the, one's the January 6th committee, right? No, uh, two's the January 6th committee. One is we have a lawsuit against the voting machines. Hmm. He did have a lawsuit against the voting machines. He does hate Fox. He does love pillows. Um, <laughs> you know what? Let's go, with, let's go with two. Let's go with two. Dan, you should have taken the two points because he would have tied, but Dan got one. Wow. John finally misses wow. five or six. My two is the fake record. one. Yeah, he really said that that little parachute shit. That was a, you know what? I sh yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. I love that he said that. He's a parachute John, pillows. Your problem was you got complacent. It's what Pat Riley calls the disease of more. <laughs> <laughs> it ha happens to a lot of champions. That's okay. I still won. I still won. You did. I'm still you the did. reigning you champion. You can Congratulations. You know, look, James Naismith, clever enough to cut to hang a peach basket. Probably wasn't pretty good at basketball. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> we'll get him next time. We'll get him yeah. next time. Uh, thank you, Elijah, for those wonderful takes. Thank you to Senator Maggie Hassan for joining us. Uh, everyone go have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you next week.